anarchy and yaks. Who, who, who does he think he is? Don't you get off the couch. With tasty philosophy and deep yaks, this is Nick Hazleton with the Narco Yakitalism. and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network, theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today we have Nick Hazelton, who's coming in from Oregon. I, I, I want to say Oregon, but you, it's, it's uh-huh. wrong, right? It's Oregon. Damn it. See? That's right. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> it's hard. And, uh, A lot of people in the East don't know how to pronounce Oregon. Right. And uh, he's an anarchist, libertarian, and voluntarist, and and he's he has a podcast. He's a founder of uh, the Anarcho Yakitalist podcast, on uh, which you can find on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can find his uh, you can find all that information on uh, anyak dot com. So that's a n dash y a k dot com. Um, and so today we're going to just talk about um, you know his podcast and um, how he became an anarchist, and um, you know just. Uh, what are you know some of the awesome people he's met? Because being a podcaster, we meet some really cool people, and uh, and I love to talk to fellow podcasters because you know we're, I think we're really the pioneers in in the new age of decentralized information. So um, I have a lot of respect for people who who do this. So Nick, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, it's an honor to be on. I'm excited to talk. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, you know I've seen you around Facebook and. Um, and I just, you know, recently heard about your podcast, maybe like, um, you know, a few months ago. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I like your style. It's really cool. I mean, you've been doing this since you were like 15. Like, God damn, I can't mm-hmm. believe this. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> you're already on the Liberty Radio Network. And yes, you know, right. you're already yeah. on the uh, the Freedom Fiends, which is really awesome. It's like like a child prodigy in, in anarcho-capitalism. So <laughs> it's really, really cool to see that, you know. Um, and I think... Uh, you know, the next generation, as as we're, you know, educating each other, you know, people are going to be raised with the idea of, of how, you know, immoral and illegitimate statism is. And um, and so that's why I have a lot of a lot of hope and optimism for the future. So, I mean, do you do you see that as well? Yeah, no. And, and thank you for all that. Uh I really appreciate it. But yeah, there are I've been lucky to meet a few more young libertarians and uh it's it's really cool to see people just pop out of nowhere somehow. They found the ideas of libertarianism through any like, thousand different ways. It's really fantastic. And I'm seeing a lot more optimism about it than I did when I think I first got into these kind of circles, the libertarian circles. I think that there are a lot of more people excited about it and Maybe it's just because my network has expanded to more positive people, but I don't know. It's, uh, but no, I feel the same way, and I'm excited to be uh, somebody who's uh, being used as an example. So before we get into um, what you've been doing now recently, can you talk a little bit about your past and uh, you know, how you came to anarchism and, uh, and volunteerism and libertarianism and then, and then eventually your podcast? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try and do this. As fast and um, <laughs> as simple as I can, um, I, I started out uh, getting interested in politics when I was about twelve. Um, I first started calling myself a libertarian during the two thousand twelve election. I think it was. That doesn't sound right. I don't know when it was. No, it would have been the two thousand eight election. No, when, when did McCain and Obama run? Wait, you're saying you're asking me if I follow politics? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, Whichever election that was, it, it was 2008. Oh, Romney, Romney was 2008, right? McCain was 2012. No, I thought it was. Let's switch it. <laughs> See that? Um, See how much I follow politics? <laughs> it's as much as you know. Yeah. All right. Go on. So in 2008, I decided to call myself a libertarian because uh, I, at school I go to, in Oregon is a very liberal state, but that's only in certain areas and I live in a rural area so I had a lot of conservative friends and I still do so most of the people around here are, are conservative but I had a few liberal friends in school I went to a small school um, and uh, 
somehow we got we started talking to each other about who our parents were voting for as if it really mattered and if and he was cared and I didn't care I I didn't care that much who was running at that time Uh, and so I decided well I need to find a way to kind of bridge the the middle and and not get you know tugged between both sides because I I just didn't want to make people uh, upset with me so I asked my dad you know well what who are you voting for and he told me Bob Barr the libertarian candidate who's not really a libertarian but uh, he was running for the ticket then so I decided well I'm just gonna say I'm gonna vote for Bob Barr that's my guy even though I was 12 or 8 or something I couldn't vote at that time <laughs> um, but that's when I first started calling myself a libertarian and uh, when I started getting interested in politics uh, I just kind of stuck on that because that's what made sense my uh grandfather and my great uncle and my dad would talk about politics in the living room Uh, my dad doesn't really drink but uh you know my grandpa and my uncle would get would have a few beers and they'd they'd all sit around and talk about politics and they were both uh kind of right wingers while my dad was a little bit more libertarian than they were and so i kind of had that influence and uh i took it i stuck with it i started getting into it more Uh, i don't know exactly when i called myself uh when I was really getting into it, I think I just said it was a libertarian. And I think I read Free to Choose by Milton Friedman. And I was like, okay, this is the right path. This makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. And I kept going with it. I kept thinking, you know, how small can government be? And so I started, well, federal government, we don't need that. State government, maybe. County governments, these things can be useful. But then I started thinking about it more. And I was like, well, I don't know. And uh, I decided that I wanted to to have... But, you know, it's just kind of at the same time, I decided I needed some something to listen to to stay informed. I didn't like Fox News. I didn't like MSNBC. I didn't like OPB. That's Oregon Public Broadcasting with the National Public Radio, NPR. Didn't like that stuff. I had the tuning app and I looked up Freedom or Liberty or something. Found the Freedom Fiends and Free Talk Live. And I started listening to the Freedom Fiends uh a whole bunch and eventually I just got to the point where I was like I'm an anarchist like I can't I can't justify government anymore like this is it and I'm done so that's that's how I got there and that was when I was 14 I, I decided to call myself an anarchist that was actually a couple I, I wrote it down in my calendar when I publicly came out as an anarchist oh, yeah? cool. on a blog I was writing and that was uh, that was just two days ago I think it was March or February 21st so I've been about three years. I've been an anarchist. Nice, nice. Wow, you actually wrote down the day that you called yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's awesome. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. With with me, it was more uh, a gradual thing, you know. And, you know, reading a creature from Jekyll Island and finding Stefan Molyneux and about peaceful parenting and you know more, more about volunteerism and Larkin Rose. And yeah, I can't really say it's not. Yeah, with some people, it's like a light switch on and off. You know, it's like it clicked that moment. You know, but me, nah. Yeah, it's more a gradual thing. Um, and and then and then you started your pod. Well, actually, before your podcast, so so t- tell me a little bit about your your schooling. So, so you eventually dropped out of school, and and mm-hmm. so can you tell me a little bit about that? I think it's a good story. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the small school I went to uh, was was started by my dad and a few community members here. Uh, try they you know they I don't know why why my they all thought they should start school maybe because they didn't like the local school district but anyway they started a charter school and it was kind of focused on um I, I don't know what it really it was supposed to be at but by the time I got into high school it was K through twelve by the time I was in high school I've been there my whole life um in high school it was, it was meant to be a college prep uh school so we were all pretty much forced to take at least one AP class a year um, I and I, I, I excelled pretty well you know I, I don't want to brag but no I, I'm I can do this sort of thing right I'm, I'm kind of a smart kid so I had straight A's my freshman year um, but at the same time I wasn't happy with my accomplishments you know, I was just sick of school and I could tell that this was not something I wanted to do. And I decided that uh, I didn't want to become a lawyer like that was my plan in the in the beginning because uh, I, I, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I could do seven years of school after high school. So I, I started kind of, you know, I, I had some issues with my mental health and I could tell, you know, this is a problem. I have too much stress in my life. I need to cut something out. So I started uh, trying to cut things, some things out. But, it, you know, it ended up that school, I could just tell it was the issue. And in about 
the end of my freshman year, uh, I, I decided that I wanted to get into agriculture. I started listening to School Sucks, and that's kind of what convinced me I don't need school. And the only reason why I'm here is because I'm being forced to be here, mm. right? So I, I decided, well, this is not something I want to do. I need to figure out a way to either get rid of my workload here by getting extra credit really quickly so that I can just skate through the next three years on a few classes um, or get out. And so I decided, well, my parents aren't going to let me get out. Um, I, I'm going to try my best, but uh, I'm just going to do some extra credit projects. And so I started working on that. Uh, right at my end of freshman year, that's when I started the podcast. So I was using that podcast to get some extra credit in language arts and social studies. Hmm. Um, so I started doing that. But then about halfway through my sophomore year, I was like, well, this is stupid, dude. I don't want to jump all through these hoops that they're making me do it. I don't care about any of this. The only reason I'm here is because they won't let me leave. Because uh, at that time, I, I had my yaks and I had a few pigs. So that's I decided you know, that, that was what I was going to do. I don't need school for that. I knew that. And so I started work on, on my parents. You know, you got to let me out of here. My dad started listening to School Sucks because, I mean, it's just a great show. But, you know, I, I turned him on to that. Uh, he was enjoying it. I could tell, you know, I was trying to, you know, warm both my parents up a little bit. Like, they can kind of understand. But, you know, they're still stuck on it. Nick needs to get his high school diploma because what if he fails? What if the business mm -hmm. fails? What, is, what will he have? So, I, you know, I told him. I was like, well, you, you know what? If you don't let me drop out, I'm going to fail out. And I just stopped. I just stopped doing my homework and stuff. I just, I didn't do anything in school. Um, and so eventually got to the point where my dad's like, okay, we got to strike a deal with him. Cause you know, he, I, I wasn't passing some of my classes. So I wasn't even going to get the credit no matter what. So he said, all right, if you make a self-education plan, I'll let you drop out. And so I drafted up a plan and say, this is how I'm going to educate myself. This is what I'm going to do outside of school. And uh, I finished my sophomore year up, turned that in to him and my mom. And they decided, all right, begrudgingly, we're, we're going to let you do it, Nick. <laughs> so I didn't have to return this this last school year. This would have been my junior year. So yeah, I, and, uh, I, I dropped out. I like to say I rose out of high school. <laughs> nice. I think that was a term Derek J. Freeman came up with. Yeah, yeah, wrote. dropout definitely has a negative connotation. But uh, but I'm just curious when you when you say you wrote down ways that you'll be educating yourself, what did you what did you say there? Um, mostly, I laid out what my goals were. Mm -hmm. So I decided that um, I'd like to be living decently comfortable at age 25. You know, be financially independent, as in that I am providing my own way. I'm not really struggling to get basic necessities, and that, um, yeah, and just that—that that, that's kind of my main goal. Uh, and so, I said that I was going to start the business, to start this farm business. So that's mainly what it was: is this is how I'm going to meet the goals with those businesses, mm. and this is what they will teach me. Meeting these goals, and you know, this is how what that's going to teach me, mm -hmm. and then having some other things in there, like I'm going to listen to this many podcasts a week, I'm going to try and read this many books, and uh, and all that sort of thing. And I, and it's not something that I reference very often anymore, but uh, that that was basically what the deal was: is lay out the goals, say what you're going to do, and then what will they teach you. So, so the and then the yaks, um, uh, you, like there's there's no family history of farming or raising animals or livestock in your family, is? Um, no, actually, my family has been in this area for over a hundred years. We, uh, the, the I'm a I'm a barnhart on any, on my mom's side, and uh, they came in and bought this whole little tiny valley here in Oregon. Hmm. So we've had the farming background, and my, um. My grandfather was into the farming, but he kind of found out he didn't really like it, so we decided to do something else. But the rest of my family on uh, my grandmother's side, is a lot of them are still into agriculture. My cousins down the road are running beef. So I was around that all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started doing 4-H with them, my cousins. And, uh, and then in the last few years, I started slowly kind of helping them out in some things like baling hay and uh this last year, I was doing tractor work when we were baling hay, um, and then I did the 
yeah, the last thing I did, and that was what decided I wanted to be into agriculture, is I, I was doing 4 H. And uh, that was what I enjoyed. Like this thing, was, it was fun working with animals. And I did my steer and I made quite a bit of money. So I was like, oh, this is, this is actually kind of nice. Uh, let's do it. But I didn't want to do, you know, I didn't want to do cattle because I thought that was boring. Mm. And uh, I, I wanted it to be a little bit different and, and unique. So I just, I just decided somehow. You're just, you're yaks, just, you're just an edgy yaks. teenager. You know, you want to be That's different. That's right. <laughs> just trying to be different, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why I got into yaks. So so before we get into the other stuff, can you tell me real quick, what's a typical day for a yak farmer? <laughs> Just curious. Um, I don't know about everybody else who raises yaks, but um, what I, right now, uh, the recent routine has been milking goats because that's also what we have. So I get up, okay. milk goats with my dad. Um, if I'm tired, I go back to bed. Or then I get up, I make my breakfast, and I start working on whatever I have on my to-do list. Or I'll, I'll plan my day, kind of write down the things I need to do, um, make sure when my appointments are, if I have them. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of proceed on doing that to-do list for the rest of the day. So primarily you, you get your income from, from milking? Um, no, milking. actually, most of the money is coming in from pigs. Pigs. Oh, sell the selling of pigs. Yeah, Slaughter, slaughtering the pigs or just selling them. Um, I sell them on the hoof, and then we take them to a, a butcher mm -hmm. for the customer. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and and what about like the yaks? Like you, any milking of the yaks or slaughtering of the yaks? Or? Um, I I would really like to start milking, but right now. I just can't work with my yaks because I have a mean bull. So <laughs> I just haven't been able to work with them in the last like six months. I guess it's bad. It's been about six months. So I haven't been able to work with them. So, But I would like to milk them someday. I'd also like to get fiber from them this spring. But right now I've only butchered one bull and uh, I'm selling him slowly right now um, by the package. So I, I'm selling hamburger and steaks and roasts and whatever just out of the freezer we have in the shed. And uh, I, I've been hitting a few places. But they, they, the yaks doesn't, they, they mature very slowly, and that's why I added pigs into the operation. Because mm. uh, the pigs will age in a year, and uh, they multiply like rabbits. Mm. And then the yaks uh, age in two years, and they only have one calf per, per pregnancy. Mm. So I've only sold half of the yak that I have. So do you, can you label it like, um, oh, I guess it's not organic, right? But like grass fed or free range or pastured or anything like that? Um, I mean, I don't label it as anything, but uh, I advertise that the yaks are 100% grass fed, that they're not, uh, I don't use chemicals, no hormones and no antibiotics. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty much all I say. But yeah, I don't, I don't have organic status. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. All right. Um, so, so can you go into a little bit of um, like, the you know some of your, your 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 recent episodes that you're most proud of you you mentioned the freedom umbrella one um yeah i guess can you can you go into a little bit of that and, and what that's about sure yeah the idea that i try to push on my show is you know how to live a good life you know i look at philosophy you know what is the really what's the goal here what are we trying to do and we're all trying to enjoy life so how are we going to do that and part of my thing is that you, you really need personal liberty. Uh, that's something what I, at least I value and many libertarians value, right? That's why we're libertarians is because we value liberty. So uh, I got turned on to Liberty Under Attack radio. Uh, Shane Radliff puts that on. Uh, he invited me to be a part of a libertarian roundtable discussion on this thing that him and a guy named Kyle Reardon are working on called the freedom umbrella of direct action. And I thought, man, this is, this is brilliant. I, I'm totally hopping on this. And there are a few other people there like uh, Cal Moline and Davi Barker names that pop in my head right away. I think there are a few more people there, but it was, it was interesting. We got to talk about this thing. What are like, so it, it's focused on, what can you do outside of the system to bring more liberty in your own personal life? So it focuses on these skill sets like, or, or you know, projects, whatever you want to take. Um, so a few of them are unschooling. There's uh, getting into uh, you know, some agorist sort of uh, things. And then there's philosophy stuff like stoicism that um, I suggested to put in there. 
So I really liked that idea. And I decided, well, I got to have Kyle and Shane to talk about it because I think it's super important. And so I was really happy with that episode. Um, and I think that, that the Freedom Umbrella is a, it's a really great project. And if you guys aren't familiar with it, definitely look into it. If you go to libertyunderattack.com, it should be up on one of his little top bars or whatever that is. And that was very interesting. I'm really happy with that show. Yeah, the um, yeah the Freedom Umbrella. Yeah, and that's the first time I heard about it. Um, and it's yeah, definitely an awesome idea. You know, the of so it's basically putting all agorist approaches in one area, right? That's basically what it is. Yeah, pretty much. How to live as free as possible. Yeah, and that's awesome because you know, as um, you know, as an anarchist and as volunteers, we we all we constantly you know people accuse us like like you complain about everything. Well, what's your solution, right? <laughs> so right. So it's nice to. Not only to say what we oppose, but to say what we support, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, you know, sure we're anti-statism. Like, uh, I don't even like the term anti-government because it, it 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 has the connotation like, if we just get the people in Washington D.C., if we just like push them out into the ocean, we're going to be fine. No, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> they're not. They're not the problem, right? The problem is in the minds of the people, right? That believe that these people have any legitimate authority over our lives and have <clears throat> and and are entitled to the fruits of our labor <laughs> and our children <laughs> so yeah absolutely so yeah that's a great idea because um you know people they you know the first step is understanding the problem right and once mm -hmm. you can do that once you can see what reality is and and you know how humanity is besieged by all these people then we can move forward and say okay now what do we do to remedy that problem and uh yeah i i, I basically tell people just um you know just <laughs> just ignore them it's like it's like if people are afraid of all you know of, of some kind of hitler or a mao or anybody you know mm -hmm. crazy people like that coming and and i love when larkin rose um he says how you know I'm not afraid of the Hitlers or the Maos or the Stalins or the Pol Pots of the world, right? What I'm afraid of is the millions of people that hallucinate that they have an authority or or power over us and when they do and when they carry out and enforce their, you know, wretched laws and regulations, that's when the violence begins. Right? So Hitler himself killed very few people, right? But people right. acting in the name of of statism have done massive amounts of evil in history, and so um, so agorism is really striking at the heart. You know, it's like I, I remember a uh, a quote I heard, I forgot who said it, which is like um, something like, um, you know, libertarians know the um, know the idea of free of freedom, anarchists understand the idea of freedom, and agorists practice. <laughs> freedom <laughs> that's right and i yeah. thought that was awesome right what do you, what do you think <laughs> no i think that's great i think that's spot on yeah yeah so so um so it's definitely an awesome idea to put all all of those things in um you know in one place where people can check and uh i'll definitely be uh you know recommending that to people to to send them send them over there um so so yeah so yeah I, and you know basically i tell people just live your life you know forget about the government forget about mm -hmm. laws forget about taxes you know just live your life be a decent person. Be, you know, compassionate and peaceful and gentle and kind. And just imagine that they don't exist. That's it. Just imagine the sociopaths don't exist. And if you do that, they have no power. They're like they're like the crazy man in a straitjacket. You, you don't you don't have to kill him. You just put him in a padded room so he doesn't hurt anybody. <laughs> you know, and he's fine. Don't worry about him. <laughs> just live mm -hmm. your life. <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And so that's that's been part of the thing, right? Is trying to live as an example. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, I don't know many libertarians personally. Um, and, and I do see some very successful people out there who are doing it, especially in the permaculture movement. I see a few libertarians. In fact, Jack Spierko calls himself an anarchist and he's part of the survival podcast. And so I see those people as being very convincing, as people who uh, people just respect like these guys are very impressive, so I think that that's something to keep in mind. Is look, how how many people really get convinced by online arguments mm. compared to uh, people like Stefan Molyneux who lay out their ideas like that, mm. and then also look at people who um people respect and be you like 
who can you point to in your local community that is really great? And wouldn't it be awesome if that was you and they were, or, or at least if this person was a libertarian? Mm-hmm. And so that's what I kind of try and do is use my uh, business and my practices to try and, you know, hey, show like, yeah, I, I am a libertarian. I'm very vocal about it, but I don't really like to argue with people that much. And if you want to argue with me, man, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> but uh, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for your, your first debate. Uh, you, you haven't done a debate yet, right? <laughs> I don't. I don't think I've done any Skype debates yeah, yet. Yeah, I did. I be. did do a de- like a small debate. I had a little bit of a. We we argued about the freedom umbrella. In fact, on that episode, I think it was Kyle Reardon and Davi Barker and I were were kind of going back and forth on mm-hmm. something. But no, yeah, no, I don't debate people. <laughs> but it's it's fun. I love debating. It's fun. Right. Um, yeah, you reminded me of um, of things like Airbnb and Uber, Mm -hmm. you know, and Lyft. And the awesome thing about those entities is that they didn't ask for permission, right? They didn't, they didn't like submit paperwork to their local, you know, um, county, uh, you know, town hall or, or, you know, or state legislators saying, can I do this? They just did it. Like there, there wasn't, there wasn't a precedent before they did it and they just did. And, and now, so now the, 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 the local and state governments are saying like, all right, these people, are doing stuff <laughs> that we don't like. What do we do about it? <laughs> so it's kind of funny uh-huh. to see how <clears throat> they just don't ask for permission. They just do. They just start their business, and they, they don't care about the you know the health department, the state department. <laughs> they, they just like come and regulate us, you know, if you dare. <laughs> right, and that's what we need more of. Is just people that just start businesses to forget about forget about if it's if it's like if, if there's a license for it or if you need to get a permit just start doing mm-hmm. it you know and start growing right. it and imagine if if so many people started doing that they would have no power whatsoever it'd be beautiful i think <laughs> right and so i unfortunately well i don't know if it's unfortunate or fortunately but we've we've taken more of a legal route we're not doing very much agorism with the uh with the farm partly because because it's just easier because if you get sued for selling raw milk, then uh, that's not really good. So right. you have to set up your LLC so right. you can have your right, right, right. protect your ass. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But still, uh, I, you know, it's it's something that you, honestly, it's not that hard to get away with selling uh, raw milk. And I'm not saying we've done it before, uh, but uh, I can speculate and say that it's not that hard if you know the right people. And if you have people that are close to you or interested in it, you know they're not going to turn you in. Then, hey, dude, just just start doing it. I'm yeah. not advocating for illegal activities, but... Well, <laughs> so, I wouldn't go so far to say that for me, but... <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, what really... What really um, saddens me is when I see these, um, you know, these 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 idiotic order followers go to an Amish dairy farm with guns drawn and hold up these, <laughs> these Amish people and and you know where's your milk where's your cheese and then you know they just proceed to just dump gallons and gallons of this stuff because mm-hmm. they were told to and it's just so sad like how can how can people live with themselves for doing something like that like this is the law you know mm-hmm. like you know, like i mean how you know what kind of atrocities in history have been have been uh justified supposedly by saying this is the law you know we got to follow the law you know and and i love um um howard zinn um you know he said that the uh you know um the problem with humanity is not in um in disobedience it's with obedience mm-hmm. <laughs> like, right you know doing doing stuff because you were told to do it right or because it was just your job right so people tr- people trying to figure out you know what's legal rather than what's right and what's moral and and that's what i love about voluntarist and anarchists is we always concern ourselves with what's moral you know and i love that so um so yeah so so can you get into your other one uh your your other uh show with Daryl Becker you talked about uh, metacognition uh, which is a term I never heard before. So, uh, so talk about that and explain what that is. Sure. So, I give a little bit of background on on what that um, kind of ties into. Is I had Daryl Becker on last year in about November or October, I think, and we talked about a few um, methods. We talked about a critical thinking method, which is we use the the trivium method of critical thinking. Are you familiar with that? 
yeah, logic, rhetoric, grammar, something like that, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So and it's an interesting thing because I think uh, that that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind is, uh, uh, you know, most of us are critical thinkers, especially in this libertarian movement. We we didn't, most of us are not just brought up and indoctrinated into libertarianism. You know, we start out as statists and uh, move towards that because we think critically. But what you find is a lot of people don't have a critical thinking method, which isn't necessarily it, it's not it's not necessarily necessary um, to be a critical thinker, but it's very useful. Um, so I found that that the critical thinking method of the trivium was a nice way to organize your thoughts. So you start out with grammar, you gather data, then you go into logic, and you make connections uh, between the data. You know, make it make sense. You know, you weed out some inconsistencies. Uh, and then you go into uh, yeah, what, what, no rhetoric, and you make it applicable to your own life. So I think that's a very nice uh, method to use, and it can help you organize things. And we also talked about nonviolent communication, which can fit in there, I think, pretty nicely because uh, nonviolent communication has a lot of criticism from a lot of people, and for good reasons. But I think a lot of people misunderstand what it's really about. And what it's about is uh, paying attention to your values and desires. NBC uh, terminology calls those needs. I don't really like the term needs for certain things. Like, I don't think you need, uh, I can't think of one off, I guess uh, emotional in intimacy. You don't need that to live, but it is something that you value. Mm -hmm. So it, you, it teaches you to pay attention to what you're uh, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and then tying it back to what values are being met or not met. I think that's very valuable in being able to understand what's going on inside yourself. So Daryl Becker just and I just continued that and built up uh, upon sort of that thing of critical thinking and these kind of cognitive uh, skill sets. We added, uh, we started talking about metacognition, and what metacognition means is. Thinking about thinking. Meta talk would be some, like talking about talking. Uh, meta singing would be singing about singing. So we started talking about meta talk and metacognition. I thought it was very interesting because he laid out uh, a few little things that he does uh, when um, mostly, mostly getting into a conversation. And this kind of fits in with the NBC stuff where uh, the first thing he does is he looks at uh, the concerns that people are expressing you know what are people uh, concerned about and then is there any evidence uh, to back up those concerns and, and he says to apply it to yourself first to so look at what concerns do you have do you have any evidence for that those concerns excuse me um, and then you move on to uh, what claims are being made um, and so you look at what are people saying what are you saying and then what are the, what is the evidence for the claims that you're making? So you kind of go through that and kind of it fits with the trivium in that you know you're trying to do your grammar work here. You're trying to gather data and making sure that you know what's going on here as best as you can, and making sure that you know is this productive? Uh, if you're talking to somebody else, um, you, you you're going to look at the attitudes too, right? And you're going to look at the attitudes, I guess, to yourself. So you want to make sure that you know what's going on in this conversation. And then you want to make sure that this is a conversation you really want to have. So a lot of the time, people don't have the right attitude going into a discussion. You know, a lot of people don't want to change their opinions. So they're not really in this thing, uh, in this you know, curious or open-minded attitude. They don't have that. They have a very confident and arrogant attitude where they think they're right. I'm going to convince this person. So kind of going through those steps will allow you to be able to first, if you apply it to yourself, kind of understand what's going on inside your own head. And then after you can kind of do that, you might want to apply it or start trying to apply it to other people and kind of see if you can identify the concerns and claims and the attitudes that these people have. And I thought that it's an interesting piece of uh, cognitive skills coupled with uh, some of the NVC uh, skills and trivium method, and then these metacognition uh, things. It, it was it was very interesting episode. I don't know if I'm uh, quite explaining it and giving it justice, but I think that it, it, they are very useful if you can learn how to apply them, especially to yourself. So I, yeah, that's if I can repeat myself, you know, apply it to yourself and then others <laughs> <laughs> afterwards. So that was kind of the idea. Hopefully, I'm not being too rambly. <laughs> no, no, it's awesome. Um, 
Yeah, the idea of nonviolent communication, I, I have heard recently uh, through Adam Kokesh. He talks about that. Mm. Um, and yeah, a couple of other. Oh, yeah, it's one woman I talked to, um, Delilah Declare. Declare she mm -hmm. on Facebook. Katie Testa. Right, that's her. Yeah, Katie Testa. She, um, mm -hmm. yeah, she talks about that. And I, I, I haven't read the book. Um, but, um, yeah, but a lot of it I feel like I, I do all, already um, when I talk to people. And, you know, uh, so, so I guess one thing that I do is like, um, you know, you try to understand where the other person is coming from. Right. And, and I, and I saw right. like when I interviewed Brett Vinat at the uh, Liberty Fest, I saw him uh, last year in October and uh, he talked about the nonviolent communication. He, he was, he's really great at that. I mean, like really mm -hmm. sitting down with somebody and um, getting to know why, you know, they support, you know, let's say public schools or, you know, welfare or whatever, you know, why they support some government program and try to get to the bottom of it and, and why, why are you so passionate and, and, and really try to analyze their thought process. And I guess Larkin Rose does this a little bit like analyzing somebody psychologically with uh, his, uh, his project, The Mirror. Um, and, uh, and without aggression, you know, or without, without let's say, um, you know, antagonizing the person mm -hmm. and making them angry because once you do that, once you, you, uh, you know, of course you don't insult them, but once you make them angry, then that's when the barriers go up. And, you know, I think it's called the backfire effect where sometimes when you, the more you, um, try to convince somebody once they're angry, the opposite happens. They just, they just hunker down and put their barriers up and that's it. You're not getting through to anything. Right. And so, yeah, stuff like nonviolent communication and also humor. We were talking about before we got on the show mm -hmm. about about the importance of using sense of humor and comedy to break a tense situation. And I know myself, I tend to do that a lot. Um, you know, of course, making fun of yourself. That's that's one of the easiest things to do because <laughs> everyone's always ready to laugh uh, when you make fun of yourself. So, so yeah, so um, I, I find those to be very valuable when talking to people about, um, you know, this idea of... Uh, Volunteerism and anarchy, um, you know. So even before I mention those words, I talk about this kind of stuff, and then they say, wait, 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 "Wait, so what are you talking about? Are you talking about anarchy?" <laughs> I'm like, "Well, what's wrong with that word? Well, let's examine that." <laughs> uh -huh. you know? Sure. So yeah, so go, 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 go. that's the yeah, that's the things that I found is that um, you know, I got into these uh, NBC and and the I, well, not the trivium as much, but I got into nonviolent communication. And trying to be a little bit more empathetic mm. when talking to people, because in my short life, I found uh, I've I've ruined some relationships because of the way uh, I was trying to advocate some of my ideas, yeah. even with libertarianism. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate, and I didn't like that, so I try to learn quickly. And no, that's that's something I try to realize. And I like the way Daryl Becker phrases this. It's one of his metaphors: is uh, you want to build bridges of empathy with mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. so that you can move your 18 wheelers of logic across <laughs> to them that's awesome I so, like that. <laughs> right so and then that's part of it like humor or using uh trying to build this really close connection with this person mm -hmm. um so so that you can both be on the same level and make sure you you understand each other and that uh you're looking for a mutually beneficial interaction mm -hmm. and you can't you know you can say well yeah of course convincing them and telling them that they're wrong is going to be beneficial to them but you have to convince them that it's beneficial mm -hmm. so you either got to let them come to it on their own or you got to find a way to show them in, in a nice way mm -hmm. like a salesperson that this is what you want right and humor definitely helps out with that that's something that i don't think that i am very good at in um, these kinds of conversations, I think that I can be funny, but it's usually in situations where I'm really comfortable with, you know, my close friends. Um, they probably would say that I'm not very funny. <laughs> I would not be surprised if they said that. Hopefully that they're joking because they're funny too. I don't know. But no, I, I think that that's a, it's a, it's something very useful. And I, I, I love talking to people that are funny, right? That's just something that's fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I've done stand-up comedy um, <clears throat> in 2000. It was 2010 um, um, to oh, 11 to 2012, and I performed uh, you know about 40 times, and it was some experience learning how to not only. So there's there's one thing, right? When you can make family 
and close friends laugh, um, mm -hmm. that's one thing. When you can make complete strangers that you never ever met <clears throat> laugh, that's something else, right? And and mm -hmm. so too often people say, um, well, you know, I, I can make my friends and family laugh, so I guess I can do stand-up comedies. <laughs> <clears throat> it doesn't always transfer, you know. It's um, sure. It's slightly different, um, and and it's and it's difficult to challenge. And one thing with me is I love challenges. That's that's been the theme of my life. Like if somebody tells me you can't do that, it's too hard. What do you think I'm going to try to do? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so many so many things in my life, uh, like stand up comedy. I mean, who who wants to do stand up comedy? Like you just wake up, like you know what I want to do. I want to go on stage just with a mic in front of complete strangers and try to make them laugh. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> like, who yeah. says that? <laughs> Nobody, right? <clears throat> right. There's a, uh, there's a, a poll that I, I remember uh, reading that people were asked, um, what are, what's your uh, number one fear in life, right? And can you guess, can you guess what it was? <laughs> Stage fright. Public, pu public, public speaking. speaking. Public speaking. Yeah, yeah. Number two is death, okay? <laughs> So more people are afraid of public speaking than death, right? So it kind of shows you how how not many people, you know, are natural public speakers. Therefore, you know, if you want to improve your, you know, public speaking skills or just inter interrelational skills or social skills with people, you got to work on it. It's a skill. It's a mm -hmm. muscle like anything else. You know, you want to get better at something, you work on it. And you put yourself in difficult situations sometimes and uh, and you learn from it. <laughs> right. Um, go ahead. <laughs> So so yeah so um so I think that uh you know that's that's really awesome and then uh and then the nonviolent communication you know go go definitely hand in hand and and I think that uh that I've uh, you know slowly like 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 when I talk to people um in public like I talk to people in like you know grocery stores in in mm -hmm. the mall you know various other stores or in the park you know because i homeschool my kids so so i go to parks and playgrounds a lot so i get into talks about often starting with schooling you know and then sure um raising parents and then uh, raising kids and then and then um you know and then, and then so I'm, I'm around a group of homeschoolers so so uh, you know it, it's kind of a it's kind of i have the foot in the door it's like well you mm -hmm. distrust government schools already right all right now let's right. take that a step further <laughs> If the government can't do education right, what do you think about something else? like? What do you think about you know the monetary system or you know, uh -huh. um, you know labor laws or whatever you know? So, so that's how I. So, so you don't do you talk to your friends um, or family about like this? Like when you're in public, do you talk about this stuff at all? Um, I don't do it a whole lot anymore. Um. I, I used to be very, very vocal about it. And uh, I mean, I, I got good at arguing because my dad loved to play devil's advocate with me. Uh, so I'd say okay. something and he'd, he'd argue with me all the time. And so I'd perfect my arguments cool. with him. Cool. So that was really fun. And so, we, and we still do it a little bit now. But uh, no, I just, I don't, I, I just don't really like to. But most of the time, I, I don't. I just use the podcast and and to Freedom Fiends as my as my outlet. <laughs> so another tactic that Lark and Rose mentioned, which I thought was pretty awesome, is because some people, like some people, you can convince just by repetition. You know, like mm -hmm. like some people require a book. Like you know, they need to read a book, like on you know human action or economics, or they need they need like theoretical philosophical books, right? And then they're going to be convinced. Mm -hmm. Other people are a little bit more simple. <laughs> they just need repetition. So with those people, uh, you know, Larkin Rose recommends, you know, sometimes what's enough for some people is just you just go up to somebody in, pu in public, you know, you just say, hey, the government's illegitimate, and then walk away. Just, just walk <laughs> away. <laughs> and if that's the first time they hear that, they're going to say, hmm, that's interesting. All right, never thought of that. But if that's the second time, they're going to say, you know what? I heard that before. Somebody said that. <laughs> And for some people, that's enough. It's like it's like if they hear something um, often enough, they're like, you know what? Maybe that's right. <laughs> and I guess in in one sense, it's a logical fallacy. It's like um, um, the the, um, the appeal to popularity, right? Mm -hmm. Just because something is popular doesn't make it true. But unfortunately, it works <laughs> with some right, people. Right, right. <laughs> and and the other thing that that I thought of was um, uh, this guy Donnie Gebert. He runs uh, uh, um. 
on the Seeds Delivery podcast, he used to run this Force to Freedom um, uh, podcast, which was um, it was headed by him and another guy, and they were both veterans. And it was basically focused on talking to veterans. How do we communicate the message of liberty and volunteerism to veterans, which is very important and very difficult, mm-hmm. right, most of the time. And most of the time, they will not listen to you or me sure. because we don't have experience in that and we can't talk from personal experience and so why are they going to listen to us like you don't know what i went through right you know that's what they're going to say so um so so uh, uh, some of his suggestions are when he talks to somebody he's like before you before you talk about anything about freedom or anarchy or anything you got to lubricate the conversation (laughs) Mm -hmm. he's like take him out for a beer go to the bar say come on i'll buy you a drink come here let me buy you a drink (laughs) And once people, most people have alcohol in their system, like, all right, now, now we can talk (laughs) and everything's calm, you know, less fiery emotions, you know, people are happier generally. Um, And the other thing is that, you know, inside of most people's minds, he, you can, he gives the analogy of a man on an elephant, right? So the logical brain, did you you heard this before? Uh, Yeah. The elephant and the rider. Yeah. 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 So the man on the elephant is, um, is the logical, rational part of the brain, and the elephant mm-hmm. is the emotional part, right? So you can do your logical arguments all you want, and the guy's going to understand. He's So the guy's going to say, all right, I'm going to go this way, but the elephant's like, no, nope, I'm going this way. <laughs> and there's no there's no changing that. And so sometimes, you know, like, like you know, I guess this goes along with nonviolent communication in that mm-hmm. we have to try to find common ground and connect with them on that level, right? So... <clears throat> So yeah, so I thought those are those are some fascinating things that uh, that you reminded me of. Um, so yeah, what do you think of those? I I think that yeah, it's a, that's totally right. I think that's awesome, and I think one of those examples of uh, those the, the repetition is the Google volunteerism. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, yeah, you're right. Pages, right? I I love that idea. They just slap the Google volunteerism on a, on any meme. I think uh-huh. it's just brilliant, and then that's and that's great. I think that's one of the things that's uh, very encouraging, right? You know, just throw it on there and something's like well yeah i am gonna google that <laughs> like, of, of course if i saw that all the time i would i would I, then that's you know that's something that uh what's that guy uh david wolf does and yeah. uh i don't i don't like him because i think he's a, he's he's fraud but um that's the guy from from food matters right i think or food, or I food inc remember. he's like the um the nutritionist and like um, like motivational speaker kind of about nutrition and health and right. Yeah. But he, he throws out a lot of kooky stuff. Like it's Does just he? stuff that, yeah. Like if what? you look into it, David avocado wolf, yeah, will yeah, come yeah. Up. and, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff he tries to sell, uh, is just ridiculous. And the way he's gotten popular is he finds these, uh, memes related to health and, and spirituality or something, mm-hmm. just throws his name on there. David really? wolf. Yeah, and so there's there's a lot of issues in there. People have given him a lot of criticism, oh, wow. but you know that method is is very uh, useful, and I think that it's it's great that people are employing that in in the libertarian circles. Yeah, I think it was uh, Dave Dave Painter who started that that um, mm-hmm. that that uh, Facebook page, uh, Google Volunteers, and and uh, yeah, it is genius. You know, it's just like repeti- constant repetition, repetition. And, and I was just thinking now, like. If like some people, I guess, write it on dollar bills, just Google volunteerism, you know, <laughs> yeah. and but but I could also imagine like, you know, uh, I, I don't know about an anarchist, but somebody who's just rebellious, who just wants to rebel for the, you know, rebel for the for the sake of rebellion. And they're going to look at that mm-hmm. and like, I, I, now that you told me to do that, I'm not going to do it just because you told me <laughs> I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so I guess for those people, it could backfire, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't win them all you know so you, you know everybody everybody exactly. needs a different method you know you, you got to tailor tailor your message you know so um mm-hmm. but uh but yeah i think uh, you know you're doing a great job with your podcast and you know i'm thrilled that it's um it's gaining momentum because i think you said in the beginning you were doing it uh, more sporadically right less frequently mm-hmm. and and now you're doing it like once a week yeah i try to do it once a week sometimes i release a, few, uh, a little bit of extra content Cool, cool. All right, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I definitely encourage everyone to uh, check out his podcast. He's, uh, you know, he's growing and um, and he's one of the youngest. Uh, I mean, do, do you know of any anarchist, uh, anarcho-capitalist um, podcasts? You know, that are younger than you. 
I don't, I don't so. know of any podcasters that are younger than me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't <laughs> think there's anybody who's younger than me out there. And if there are, man, get in contact with me. Let's, right. let's talk because I think that's great. I love uh, encouraging young people. Exactly. God damn it. You got to network, you know. That's, how, that's, how it that's is. right. <laughs> that's how to strengthen, especially if you live in the backwoods in the middle of nowhere like uh, Nick does. <laughs> <laughs> that's right thank, thank god for the, the internet hills right? of oregon thank god for the internet like where would you be without the internet you know oh man <laughs> alone that's with your right. alone with your yaks and your anarchist message and who would listen to you without the internet you know <laughs> You'd just be <laughs> shouting into the hills hello <laughs> i don't care <laughs> government. google voluntary well i wouldn't right. have internet so i couldn't say google <laughs> right exactly <laughs> <laughs> So, oh yeah, I mean, that brings up another can of worms, which is the internet, which is, I think, that one of the wonderful things that have, has catalyzed all of these new, um, you know, people that are being more skeptical of uh, of the system and the, and the state and things like that. And I, I liken it mm -hmm. to, you know, in the 1400s when, when Gutenberg came out with his printing press and how that revolutionized um, the spread of information. And how that threatened the church at that time, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where every every book before then was not only was it handwritten and hand copied, but it was mostly everything was in Latin and no peasant at that time could read Latin. And so they right. had a tremendous power. So now they can print books. They can not only print books, but they can do so in their own local languages. So it's just empowered mm -hmm. them. And so I think that, you know, magnified by like a thousand or ten thousand is is what the Internet has done. Um, and, uh, and it's just beginning, you know, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg and, you know, my kids that are five and three are going to grow up in a world so, so much different than I did. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you know, I think the internet is breaking down barriers, destroying, um, <clears throat> nas uh, nationalism because, uh, you know, how can you hate somebody from another country when you can just, you know, Facebook friend request them, see what they post or Skype talk, st Skype chat with them and, and say, you know, do you, are you do you want to blow up a building? Like, do you want to suicide yourself? No? All right, because that's what I heard. <laughs> you know? It, it, sure. You can't hate people when you know, when you have all this communication. So, mm -hmm. so I'm very optimistic Please. for the future. Um, but uh, but if you want to, if you want to finish up, um, any last words about your podcast or anything on your mind um, before we sign off? Um. No, I mean, I guess uh, definitely check out the podcast. Uh, I'm on multiple, uh, what do you call them, podcatchers? Isn't that what they are? Like TuneIn and, uh, and like, uh, Stitcher and whatever they all are. I don't know. Are they hosting sites or something? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm on most of those, <laughs> so you can find them. So, what, so, so Podomatic, just, Stitcher, right? Yep. Yeah, I'm on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Podomatic, the Liberty Radio Network, and then my website. Stop and bragging, if you look up bragging, Nick man. Hazleton, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> no, because I just I just have iTunes and Stitch. I'm like, damn, he's got all those. Shoot, <laughs> <laughs> it's not too hard to get on TuneIn. Yeah, um, and Podomatic is a little bit of extra work, but you can do it like for free. You can just do it. Uh, uh, I definitely. I, there's not a lot of stuff going on in Podomatic, honestly. I don't okay. get like any traffic. But anyway, <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, you can find me. Um, if you just look up Nick Hazelton, you'll find my website. If you go to the posts, I think you can go underneath. You can follow me on Twitter, and then you can also like the podcast uh, Facebook page. And then if you add me on Facebook, uh, if we have mutual friends, I'll, I'll add you. But please definitely send me a message. Just let me know uh, why you're adding me, and uh, just so we can talk and expand our networks. I love it. But yeah, definitely check out the podcast, the Narco Yakutalism Podcast at an-yak.com that's an-yak.com awesome yes definitely please check them out you know we need to uh, grow our networks and spread the liberty message and um, I think that uh, you know the more people understand you know what liberty truly means what volunteerism means what self-ownership property rights non-aggression means I think um, you know statism is on its deathbed it's a dinosaur relic or a, it's a relic of a barbarous age and uh, it will be, it will be um, confined to the dustbin of history, um, along with chain slavery, and uh, 
yeah, and other things like that. So I, I think that um, it's a one-way street, one-way path to, to voluntarism. And I'm doing my best, and Nick's doing his best to uh, encourage that. You know, just help it along. It's, come on, come on, quick, quick, a little bit quicker, please. <laughs> I want to, I want to be a little freer before I die. Okay, please, quick. <laughs> so, um, well, yeah, you know, you, you know, you know, what's amazing, really quick, is that a lot of the abolitionists of the 19th century, you know, did not live to see. So, you know, some of them did not live to see the end of slavery. And mm-hmm. and that's okay, you know. It's like maybe we'll, we're not going to live to see the end of statism, but that's okay. You know, we did our part, and maybe hopefully our kids or their kids will live to see it. And um, you know, I, I think that what's important is that we're doing our best to you know provide a little bit more freedom, a little bit more peace, you know, a little bit more prosperity in the world, and less coercion, less aggression, less harm. Right? It's, I think you know, it's like you know, people say you know, talk about anarchy and volunteers, like it's you're so radical, you're so extreme. You're like, I'm not really. Because what I'm basically yeah. saying is like, if we have to abide by morality, basic morality, why don't they have to abide by basic? Right. Because like, that's so extreme of a message. Like, and and the way Dana Martin, uh, you know, when she phrased it, when I was interviewing her, she said, um, "Kindness is revolutionary." And isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. Like, you have to say, "Kindness is revolutionary." What kind of a world right. do you live in when you have to say that? It's um, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome uh, awesome conversation, Nick. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah. So if anybody wants... Actually, before we go, let, let me just ask you, Nick. Um, if somebody wants to donate, can they donate to you? Yeah, you can donate uh, Bitcoin or through PayPal if you go to the website. I think it's and-yak.com backslash donate. Um, but yeah, you can find the donate page if you go to my website. Yes, help him out. Help out his yaks. You know, we need more yaks sure. in the world. Um, <laughs> that's the other problem with the world. Too much days and not enough yaks. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so help him out. And uh, if you want to donate to my show, um, you know, you can do so through Bitcoin, through PayPal, or Patreon. Uh, it's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. Um, I love having wonderful guests like uh, Nick here, and I want to do more. And uh, monetary compensation is always appreciated. Um, you know, we're free market capitalists, so we we believe in uh, value for value, right? If you find value in this content, mm-hmm. you can please uh, patronize it. That's how you, you know, it's the only democracy I support is voting with your dollars, right? So you want to see something more of in the world, you buy it, right? That's your vote. So, um, and also if, if you want to leave a, any message or comment on my show, you can either comment under the, the video or you can send me an email, uh, Danilo Kipu at yahoo.com. Uh, that's Danilo, D-A-N-I-L-O, Kipu, K-I-P-U, at yahoo.com. So send me a message if you have any comments about the show. So, uh, Nick, thanks a lot. I uh, really appreciate it. So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>